Hello, gardeners, and welcome to Mid-American Gardener. We're glad that you have joined us, and we are going to talk about all things plants and maybe even weather-related things that have to do with plants. So thank you for being here and tuning in. I'm Diane Nolan, and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the Crop Sciences Department in the College of Aces. So my area is cut flowers and landscape plants, mostly perennials. Now, who else is here? And what is their expertise? Listen up and you can direct your questions that way. And I'm gonna throw it over to you, John Bodensteiner. Okay, I'm a Vermilion County Master Gardener. Um, my interests are, if it's green and grows, <laughs> I think I like it. More specific. Uh, I like tomatoes. <laughs> uh, I, I like perennials, especially hostas. I've got fruit trees, which leads me into uh, my first question. And it's kind of weather related because Although this happens all the time or every year during the winter especially, um, we have a couple of, of listeners. One had a Fuji apple tree that was completely girdled. And when I say girdled, this is what I mean, right? This, this wound right here, it goes all the way around the tree. This could be saved with a lot of technical help uh, what we've, we've seen is where they actually, almost like a skin graft, they take a, a, a piece of bark from another part of the plant and graft it, but you have to be really lucky. Most of the time it's not worth it. Um, and then I had another lady with a pear tree, and, and the reason this was worse this year is the snow got up higher, they didn't have anything else to eat. The cambium layer on, on trees is very nutritional, it's high in energy, so they really do like it. Um, the, the lady with the Fuji apple, I doubt that you're gonna be able to save that tree. It's probably be a lot easier uh, just to go out and buy a new one. Uh, the, the lady with the pear tree, hers didn't seem to be quite as bad. Hers was up higher and it sounded more like just a, a wound and then some on the branch that got girdled. The, the, this branch here got girdled. That you're probably gonna to have to trim off and what I'd suggest is they have these wraps that work fairly, fairly nice, um, but you have to get them on before the snow flies, and they're they're pretty adaptable to branches. Uh, they've got these little holes in them where you can actually put the um, stem in. Of course, that's going to leave it open to rabbits, deer, whatever is going to be. Um, eating it. Another, another thing that you can do is put a small fence around the um, tree. Um, sometimes you may need, may need to make it a, a, you know, you can buy a three foot fence and make it wide enough that they can't reach over it. And, but unfortunately with the Fuji apple, I think that one is probably, being it's girdled, it's eaten all the way around. That one is probably gone. Sometimes they will repair. You may, if you don't have to replace it this year, save it if it if it if it does callous over um that's fine but this year with the weather we had i think we're going to have not only on on fruit trees but on just about a lot of your trees mm -hmm. john if that had been a smaller diameter tree and it was above the graft uh, a person could cut that off by a bud couldn't they and that Correct. would grow over and then it would grow over if and that's but this is th about too large isn't this it? is too large and if it was Above the graft, you still, if, it, if it's above the graft, you still might be able to do that if, the, if it's eaten below the graft, I mean above the graft. Right. If it's below the graft, then you're just going to get mm -hmm. so totally a rootstock, and, yeah. and that's not going to be the same apple that you had. Mm -hmm. That's not going to be a Fuji apple or a pear tree that you're going to want to, well, to save. Thank you, John, and to our viewers, because I think that's <clears throat> a bit of a symptom. This uh, year. Yeah, this year it's going to yeah. be, uh, unfortunately, it's going to be. Okay, well, thank you so much. And let's go on to you next, Larry Shobe in the middle. Okay, I'm the grounds gardener for Eastern Illinois University. And of course, I deal with flowers, shrubs, trees, and vines to some degree, always, for a long, long time. And uh, so I have one here from a viewer who wants to know how he can reduce the size of his ornamental grasses, which have gotten large and are taking up too much room in his flower bed. And he was asking if he could put a bucket or something over the center of the grass and uh, then spray it with Roundup. You can do that provided 
you cut the grass off in the spring of the year and put something over the very part of it, the center that you want to protect. But you've got to let that grass get started growing, the new grass, because that's the only way that Roundup will work. It's a contact killer with, with the new green grass. It, if you're doing it before that date while it's still brown, it's, it's not going to do a bit of good. So you must wait until it's growing, and that would be a good way to kill it. But make sure that you've got it, it covered if you're using a bucket, that it fits down tight so that uh, none, none of the uh, Roundup will get on any of those stems that's in under the, the bucket, and you'll be fine. I was looking at one of my clumps of hormonal grass, and I'm just going to start taking divisions mm -hmm. off of it. Mm -hmm. And real small ones, I have a really nice sharp spade. So that might be a little bit of work for this person, but it's very possible Right, you, you can make it round again and just mm -hmm. take out those, that outer edge, however deep you need to. Because I think to. people think they have to lift the whole thing and divide it. You no. just take, you just kind of take off a little section on the side. Just take your spade down, a spade is a good tool to use, and then get beneath the grass. And you don't have to be too many inches beneath that section that you want to take out. It'll work just fine. Because that's called like root Diane pruning. Said. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> root pruning as and long less as you're weight. Beneth right. It, just so far there enough. is another way or do a combination. That's Thank right. you, Larry. If she Larry. doesn't want to do it, she could have a neighbor if they want some have right. them do the work. Right. Ooh, <laughs> sneaky. And if you're up in years, have, have a younger person do that for yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We've got all kinds of great ideas here. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You're and now I'm going to throw the, um, the dais over to Dr. Jim Angel. Hi there, Jim. Hi, uh, yes, I'm Jim Angel. I'm the Illinois State Climatologist at the Illinois State Water Survey. Mm -hmm. And so I'm interested in gardening and how weather affects gardening and how it affects weather, how it affects gardeners as right. <laughs> this year, uh, since we all got stuck inside. Uh, <laughs> you know, one of the things that we, when I do this show in, in the spring is, the, is we talk about the last date of the, of the uh, spring frost. and. For us in central Illinois, I always say it's about mid-April, and if you get into southern Illinois, it's early April, and by the time you get into northern Illinois, it's late April. So it kind of spans the month of April as you go across the state, and usually I'd add about a week or two on to that just to be on the safe side. So mm -hmm. I always hate to say when people ask me that, you know, the average day is April 15th, but I don't want people to think that on the 16th they're, they're okay to uh, plant those And I uh, believe... I remember, a, and we talked about this, I remember a frost May 20th, mm -hmm. May 20th, so. That's right, and the other thing that gives us a lot of fits is that we had a lot of really warm weather early on, mm -hmm. and that gets everything going, and then we get that late frost. This year, with the cold winter and the cold spring, I'm not as worried about a, a late frost at this point, because everything's so slow to begin with. Mm -hmm. It's and that not kind bad. Of, and that kind of segues into my next topic, which is soil temperatures, and I think that's one of the reasons we've been so slow this spring is the soil temperature has actually been pretty cold. They've only been in the 30s and 40s for the last couple of weeks and just now getting up into the 50s. And you know there's um, uh, this winter they actually had a lot of frost in, in the ground so hopefully it yes. killed off some of the pest. We'll see how that works out. Uh, but you know one of the things they do to kind of track soil temperatures they actually use a meat thermometer. I have one here <laughs> that's cost about three dollars at the store. A real high-tech solution but what it does is tell you the soil temperature. You know, some things get, uh, need a certain temperature to germinate. So mm -hmm. kind of the cold season vegetables need about 35, it's 40 degrees. It's not all that degrees. long, is it? That's right, yeah. It's only a couple inches. So, and that's usually mostly interested in the in the earth's surface uh, temperatures. And, you know, if it's in the 50s, then a lot of the other things will germinate as well. So it's just a nice, quick way to check the soil temperatures. You can also go online at, at the water survey, and we have a soil temperature network. Uh, and check it around the state. But I'd also just caution that you don't want to put this in your pot roast after you check the <laughs> garden. So. Wise decision. <laughs> Have it in the gardening shed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, great. Thank you, Jim, because we really are interested in when can we get out and plant. All right. Well, let's uh, go to a special Did You Know next. <laughs> Okay, well, 
let's go next to the phone lines and we're going to go to line one and it's a question about bamboo. Hello there, line one. Yes. Okay. Uh, I bought this bamboo. I probably had it uh, 15 years. And it's a uh, and this bamboo was guaranteed to be uh, resistant to 15 to 20 below. <laughs> can you turn your television off, please? I can oh. hear. Yeah, turn your TV off, please. Okay, keep going. Uh, at any rate, uh, this year it died, all of it. I have two big patches. And Larry knows. <laughs> And your your is bamboo it still has, alive is a root still alive. What? How do I treat this? What do I do next? The best thing. Our winter has been so severe this year that you're ahead to cut it down flush with the ground, mm -hmm. and it will come up and it'll be quite tall before the season's over. There'll be a lot, several new canes come up, and and they'll be fine. But uh, you'll have brown in it all summer if you try to leave it. There might be a few shoots that uh, will leaf out, but very few of them this year. So we've cut ours at Eastern down to the ground and they'll mm -hmm. start over. Yep. Same will go for butterfly bushes. Yep. Uh, don't crepe even myrtle if you can raise it myrtle. too. Mm -hmm. But they, those two will come up and they'll bloom in a, in, in a growing season generally, unless we would have a very cool summer. I think my Chicago fig did the same thing. It's died to the ground. And okay. Very good. Well, thank you for that question. And let's go on to Brad's question on line two about a fig. Hi there, Brad. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. I, I have a uh, brown turkey fig I got through a mail order catalog, and it said it was hardy to zone five, and I could just plant it in the ground. Mm -hmm. But I have another book that mm -hmm. says it's zone eight. So is it really hardy or not? Or should I just put it in a pot? I think that one I would put in a pot. I have a Chicago hardy fig that's zone six. And I believe that, that the, the other is a zone eight. I don't think that that's zone five uh, anywhere. Um, so uh, I, I, unless it's a new variety that I'm not familiar with, but mine died to the ground. Uh, but that's a zone six variety and Last year, it didn't die all the way to the ground. It did come up, you know, about a foot high, but I, but I mulched it heavily, too. So I would keep it in a pot, put it outside as soon as you're, you're uh, pretty sure that, you know, we're not going to have frosts. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if you hear that we're going to have 36, 34, I would take it in just to be sure because those new tender leaves are going to be more susceptible to just even uh, cold temperatures. But... Uh, my experience is it's probably a zone eight. The Chicago Hardy is the only one that I know is zone six, and I haven't seen any that are zone five. But the only thing, if you don't want to dig it every year, you, you can, like John said, uh, mulch that, mm -hmm. and it will certainly come up. If, you've got it, if you plant it a little bit deep when you first plant them, and then you mulch them, they'll come up every year. They will not produce fruit, probably, if they uh, go down to the ground. But through mild winters, uh, you can mulch yep. them or put protection around them, and, and uh, they will live through and fruit for you. Okay. Well, thank you for that. And let's go on next to Carol's question on line three, and it's about red raspberries. Hi there, Carol. Line three. Carol, are you there? All right, well, we'll have to go to the next question, which is probably on line four. Hi, is there someone on line four? We miss Carol. Hello? Hi, what's your question? I have a butterfly bush. Dang thing's about eight, nine foot tall at the southwest corner of uh, uh, home. It won't be anymore. I want to know when I should trim it. How far should I trim it? Okay. We were kind of talking about this a little bit, but what about an eight to nine foot butterfly bush? Uh, is it, it still? It won't make any difference the size of it this winter. It's died clear to the ground. Uh, even if it, most of them, even though they don't have protection, they will still begin to bud out and it, uh, depend on where you live. In Charleston, that area, they're beginning to send up new growth at the ground. So what you need to do is just cut it off 
flush with the ground or where you, just above where you see it budding and it will, most all of them will go ahead and grow, mm -hmm. but occasionally they do die. Okay, well thank you for that question and I knew there'd be quite a bit of Am I question. talking too loud? No, I think it'd be quite, uh, I think it's just right, but I think it'd be quite a bit of questions about frost and yeah. dieback. So I think this is a year like the zone six plants are not going to do too well yeah. in Central Illinois. No. No. Two years not before much. we've lucked out because right. of mild. Well, this is yeah, the, six, the zone six have died for me. Leyland yeah. Cypress and Buford Holly and those, oh. they're and, dead. And we're s really and close to zone six yep. here and you're in zone six, mm -hmm. but. Just barely, but, yeah. But for 20, 25 years, or they have, one of them is above my house, the Leyland Cypress. And it Cypress. died. Yes. So yeah. that it's is just. Kind of, it's kind of going to be a luck of the draw mm -hmm. this year. So I'm not planting any trees that are zone six anymore. Yeah, exactly. Ooh, you heard it here first. <laughs> you have to have a, quite the microclimate. Yes. I know people I would well, see who would plant bananas and they would cover them up with just hideous, hideous covering and uh, put a heater, a space heater out. I said, just face it, you're zone five. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Move on. Diane, yeah. there is one banana that Except is that extremely one. hardy, and you can cut that down to the ground, put a, a little thin layer of, of dirt on it, I do, and then pile uh, either ball cypress leaves or uh, needles from white pines on top of them, and every winter they've come up, and I think that one will come up. Mm. Okay, that's the And they the get to test. be huge circles. <laughs> oh, wow. Well, maybe then there is hope for some other things. Well, we're going to go to our next uh, round of emails and, or show and tell. So, John, let's go to you. Okay, I had a question on m wild milkweed, which I have grown in my yard for many, many years. does like to spread underground. So uh, their question was, last year I harvested seeds from wild milkweed and they intend to plant these to attract the monarch butterflies, which I, they, they, you know, monarchs, if you get the caterpillars, they'll eat 20 leaves on an average to before they, they, they chrysalis and then turn into the butterflies. So you need quite a few plants. Uh, when do I plant the seeds? How deep? And any other uh, culture uh, suggestions? Okay, plant them one eighth below the surface of the ground. You're gonna want to keep them at, and, and if you, I would suggest you do it inside because they, the, the seeds, which I do have some, um, germinate when they are about 70 degrees. Uh, here's some, this is what the milk pods look like and this is what they look like after the seeds are gone. But uh, they, they, you need to keep them inside for a, for a while until they get about two or three sets of leaves, pinch them off, it's going to branch so that you get multiple branches. Um, they do have a long tap root. So put them in a, in a larger uh, container and then get them out as soon as you can. Um, aphids are, and spider mites are a problem. Um, safety tips, um, they do have a milky sap, which is why the monarchs like them because it is very bitter. If the birds try to attack the monarch butterfly, they're inexperienced, they'll chew down on one, it's so bitter they spit it out and they'll never go back. And that's why some of the other butterflies mimic the looks of monarchs mm -hmm. because the birds usually won't attack them. But if you get any of that milk on, on that sap on, you do wash it off. It's kind of like poinsettias, uh, some of the other milky substances. Some people are allergic to it. Uh, just wash it off right away, dry, and you should be good. But uh, monarchs need it. We had a, they had a really rough winter in Mexico uh, this year, so we're not sure in how many we're going to see this year. Uh, Kansas City has a wonderful site. I've been on Monarch Watch, and every time I, I, I can catch them and then put a little tag on them and then send, send them on their way, and if somebody else finds them, we kind of know the rut between oh, here great. and, and uh, Mexico, and so we planted milkweeds wherever... Uh, they are excellent. So, uh, it's it's uh, Kansas City has a very Kansas City University has a very good website, so they have okay. a lot of information on it. Great, thank you, John. That was great. Now let's move on to you, Larry. Okay, we have a, a viewer who uh, wants to know uh, if there's a particular evergreen that is two to three foot tall 
and I presume no more than maybe two feet wide, to plant along a sidewalk. But his problem that he's trying to work around is the dogs that sometimes do their business on evergreen trees. And he wanted to know if, he, if there was a variety that uh, they wouldn't really damage and, and show brown. And there really isn't. Uh, all shrubs, whether they're deciduous or, or evergreen, they cannot take a, a dog wetting on them. So uh, you'll just have to uh, cut those areas out when they occur. And sometimes you can maybe tie some branches together if it's too many branches dead in a section. But otherwise, there are miniatures in, in so many different evergreens, and you can just ask the various nurseries, or if you get catalogs, that they often have the more miniature types that you can put along the sidewalks. But there's still uh, nothing will prevent, uh, you can't find a variety, I'll put it that way, that is uh, dog proof in that respect. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Larry. And now we're gonna go back to Jim and we wanna hear a little bit more about soil temperature oh, since yes. we've got you here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, you know, soil temperature is very critical, especially for germination of seed because you don't wanna just put seed in the ground and let it sit there and when it's too cold and let it rot. So what you really wanna do is, is wait until the soil is warm enough for, you can st uh, for it to actually germinate. So most of the cold season varieties of, of vegetables, it's about 50 degrees or so. Yay. The warmer varieties, and we're about 50 degrees right now, so mm -hmm. the warmer varieties, more like about 60 degrees, and some, some things even like even warmer. Uh, so things like tomatoes and stuff, it's about like 60 degrees. But So we're right on the cusp of just starting the, the germination season, and I think we'll see that uh, in the next couple of weeks. I have peas that are germinated. You know, that's true of bulbs, too. Yes. Uh, Caladiums and elephant ears, the soil temperature needs to be 70 degrees for those two. In I'm particular. not surprised at mm -hmm. all. So don't rush. Don't rush into things, except peas, maybe potatoes, kohlrabi. There's cabbages, quite, radish, cabbages yeah, lettuce, lettuce, spinach, and radish. And we've heard that we don't plant our Brussels sprouts until later. Even That's though they, correct. Because they get... They like the, to cool now, but it's not cool when it's... When, they, when they're forming the when Brussels sprouts. When they taste better. With the bulbs, if you can start them, you know, in a pot inside, then it's okay to put them outside. But if it's really wet and moist and those temperatures are below 70, they rot and stay yeah. and grow. Don't do that. Well, speaking of bulbs, we're going to go to one that's kind of like a bulb. We want to go to our mag question, and it's about a corm. Crocus are my, I think my favorite corm. I think crocus are corms and. Are they? Okay. I think that's correct. And there's quite Oxalis a few. Oxalis too. Oxalis is a corm, mm -hmm. yeah. And that reddish one is really hardy if you plant it deep enough in the ground and How mulch deep it? do you have to plant it? Well, it depends on where you're planting it yeah. probably. So a couple if it's up against a building with a basement which or something. A couple uh, inches? Yeah, and okay. then mulch it, and they come up glowing. Because I have that one, and I bring <laughs> and it in. And it's hardier than the green one. I believe that. That's really pretty. Okay, we want to go to line five next, and it's about a raspberry, and this is Greg's question. Hi there, Greg. Hi. Last season, our raspberries, the second flush, the second crop, we had this little white worm. It was about the size of a hair. It was really hard to identify. We, If you'd have picked it up off the shrub and ate it, you wouldn't even have known it. But when we were cleaning them out, we saw them in there. Do you know what that is, and do you know how we can treat it so they can remain edible? We didn't have it in the first crop or the first flush, but the later ones, they were seemed like all over. Hmm. I was looking at John, and John's looking at me. <laughs> I have no I idea what that, that was. I've never ran into that. I don't know if that's... It was I don't have it on mine. I didn't have them on mine. Now, it might have been just a seasonal... Do you have anything else that's in the area that had the, the caterpillars on them or little? No, it was just a hair-like worm that was like within the the different, you know how the flesh on those is little 
individual pieces. It's yes. almost like in between them when you open the raspberry up inside. And oh, okay. Okay. I've, we'll have to look that up. We'll have to I find out. Yeah, that's not one we can guess on. I just no, hadn't no. noticed. Not if it's and I did inside. get a second flush on my raspberries. Yeah, I did too. But I Something's didn't. probably stinging that laying an egg in there, and that's and it what's could be attached out. And you know, curved, regional you know. too. Yeah, right. But we'll we'll have a when we have an entomologist on, we will definitely ask them, and and hopefully they'll yeah, know it. Yeah, just listen up. We'll we'll find an but answer. But thank you for letting us know about that. Wow. The show certainly goes fast. Thank you for being on, and thank you for watching. There's so much to do. We hope that you have a great week gardening. See you next time. Bye-bye.